Welcome to Nationwide on the network service of the NTA. We're glad to have you join us once again. I am Lydia Odije Ochi. Now the details. The Federal Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy has been given the go-ahead to begin the immediate deployment of the fifth generation network across Nigeria. This followed the approval of a national policy on 5G network for Nigeria's digital economy by the Federal Executive Council. The Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, Professor Isa Ali Ibrahim Pantami, announced this while briefing journalists after the Council's meeting presided over by President Muhammad Buhari. We'll bring you details in the course of the bulletin. The Minister of Labor and Employment, Chris Ngige, has asked health workers to be considerate of the financial state of the country as they press home demands for better welfare. The minister was speaking at a meeting between the Presidential Committee on Salaries and the Joint Health Sector Union's Johesu and Assembly of Healthcare Professional Association over threats of an indefinite strike issued by the unions. Joseph Otsen reports. The Joint Health Sector Union's Johesu and Assembly of Healthcare Professionals Association, ALPA, had on 3rd of September threatened to commence an indefinite strike in 15 days if the federal government does not address outstanding welfare issues of their members. This ultimatum has brought all parties back to the negotiation table to avoid a total shutdown of Nigeria's healthcare sector. The monthly payments are being done as a when due. If there are areas of impromptu allowances that have come up, special allowances or special payments or areas that have come up, We'll discuss it. The, the, the public hospitals are the, most, are the cheapest hospitals that our population can go to. So considering all this, we hardly go on strike. And sometimes we are not being seen as the weaklings. After hours of closed-door discussion, the key actors say agreement in principles have been reached on upward review of hazard allowances, retirement age of health workers, non-implementation of allowances in the 2017 MOA, payment of COVID-19 endorsement and hazard allowances. The Nigeria's health sector is already facing disruption in services after resident doctors embark on an industrial action on the 2nd of August 2021. In Abuja, Joseph Utsen, NTA News. The Nigeria Customs Service Apapa Area Command, in collaboration with the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, and the Department of State, State Services, DSS, have uncovered a huge consignment of illicit drug captagon pills weighing 74.119 kilograms at the Apapa Seaport in Lagos State. Abdul Malik Hassan reports. Nigeria's fight against illicit drug trafficking seems to be gaining momentum as the dragnet of joint security operations has just discovered a disturbing competence that may not be far from the nation's unending battle to put the issue of illicit drug use to rest. It is a 74.119 kilogram of captagon discovered in a dismantled machine at the Apapa seaport in Lagos. These experts believe that the long-term use of the illicit drug could lead to extreme depression, lethargy, insomnia, occasional palpitation, heart and blood vessel toxicity, and malnutrition, among others. Abdul Malik Hassan, NTA News. 
The Nigeria Center for Disease Control has confirmed 597 new cases of COVID-19 in the country. The latest figures released bring the total number of confirmed cases to 196,487 infections in the country. A breakdown of the new cases indicates that Lagos recorded the highest number for the day with 204 new infections. Rivers recorded 89, Edo 65, FCT 50, Oyo 47, Enugu 46, Ekiti 24, Cross River 17, Delta and Gombe 15 cases each, Oshun 12, Plateau 6, Benue 5, Kano with two cases. With this latest development, Nigeria now has 196,487 confirmed cases of COVID-19, out of which 185,159 were treated and discharged, while 2,573 persons have so far died of the virus. It is an established fact that attaining a literate society reduces the social evils in a nation. September 8th is here, and facts sharing on literacy learning amongst people is what is surrounding this day. Abdul Malik Hassan reports on the issue that is affecting many Nigerians. Son, if you are changing it to draw now, who can change it to draw now and tell me? Not everyone has the ability to read, write, speak, or even listen in a way that communicates effectively and makes sense to the world. But there are some despite facing a series of challenges, are passionate about being literate. 51-year-old Jessica C. Hitman is one of such people, and her current quest to learn was influenced by a challenge. When I was working with uh, one company, they sent me to bank. Then when I went, I cannot write in, in words. So I asked one woman to help me, to write it for me. She said it's not this time that a person will uh, write uh, something, write uh, things to a person. Everybody is educated. Then I look at myself and I remember back, yes, yes, back. I say I like to, I like school, but my parents didn't allow me to go to school. The United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization says at least 773 million young people and adults lack basic literacy skills and it is believed that education is phenomenal key to development and is evolving with civilization but the big question is what becomes of the fate of those who lack basic literacy skills somebody who cannot read and write will find it difficult to know what is happening around him we have to keep them busy. Otherwise, they are easy recruits for all social vices. Of course, you can't handle business without education. Before, I, you cannot tell me, come. I will, I will just look at you. But now, if you tell me, come, I will come. Like Jessica, there are thousands of people out there without basic literacy skills. Who knows, her story might just be hope rising for them. Abdul Malik Hassan, NTA News. Emed Young Umar also reports on the significance of the day. International Literacy Day is observed September 8th annually to highlight the importance of literacy as a tool for societal development. The COVID-19 crisis has disrupted the learning of children, young people and adults at an unprecedented scale as 773 million young people and adults lack basic literacy skills. According to United Nations Educational Scientific and Cultural Organization, literate rate of Nigeria has remained at 62.02 percent from 1991 till date. This shows a drift in education sector. Nothing has really changed. The same hundred students in the class, the same everything that existed before COVID, COVID is still existing now. As I looked at the literacy rate of recent, it was down in 50s, 57, 56, and then about, it's dropping. I keep asking myself, why is it dropping? 
when many other places we are having 88 and so when we are given spaces like that you see that a particular hall will not be enough for um, students of a particular um, department so it has really affected the educational sector However, despite the global crisis, efforts have been made to find alternative ways to ensure the continuity of learning, including distant learning, often in combination with classroom learning. Many universities would be prepared to go e-learning. But let me ask you one question. How many of the students even have laptop that they will be able to access the lecture? The lecture can be in, on air. But how many will be able to access? The theme, literacy for a human-centered recovery, narrowing the digital divide, is a clarion call that literacy is an integral part of education for a sustainable development. In Uyo, Emid Yongmo, NTA News. To shed more light on the uniqueness of the day, we have in the studio Judith Giwa Amu, Education Officer, UNICEF. She is also the National Coordinator, Education in Emergencies Working Group. You're welcome to Nationwide. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. Now, uh, literacy challenges continues to persist, especially with the increasing number of internally displaced persons. How can this issue be addressed? Well, beyond um, the internally displaced persons, who are not, um, they are not able to access you know, quality education by way of having sufficiency of teachers. We know that teachers are the source of education. So a literate teacher will be able to support a literate learner. So we, it's, it's something that we we'll probably have to go and look at it from a systemic um, point of perspective. Look at how, um, what are the resources available to train these teachers at the pre-service levels? Do they have the right, um, facilities, are they able to, um, I mean, are they able to provide those materials that they need? And then when you get to the school level, um, it's not just training the children, they also need resource materials mm -hmm. for them to make references to, for them to identify with. Mm -hmm. um, a child can be said to be literate, but may not be said to be educated, mm -hmm. the conversation we had, mm -hmm. because education is beyond that. It's mm -hmm. more of application of the knowledge you have acquired. Mm -hmm. Appla application in the sense that Probably, I give an example like financial literacy. Mm -hmm. If you cannot read, you cannot even purchase, you can be cheated. Mm -hmm. You can even drink poison because you do not know the measurement. Mm -hmm. So the, the place of foundational literacy and numeracy is mm -hmm. very critical. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have a pre-primary um, policy which says that children at the age of three to five should actually, you know, be brought into the education system, be stimulated so that they are able to grab um, knowledge as they get it. Mm -hmm. We are told that children about at the age of about five, that is when the brain is most formed and it's, mo it's like a sponge. As it's ready to, whatever. yes. So if that child is not appropriately stimulated, mm -hmm. you know, you lose a bit of it. Mm -hmm. And then as the child progresses, because there's been no, um, we've not been able to attract that attention for the child to really desire. Mm -hmm. Children that have been well stimulated, they are ready to grab you know, anything you teach them, they, the way they are so smart, mm -hmm. you wonder, but that is because they were able to get the right, right, you know, intervention at the right time. Okay, now how can this be extended to the rural areas, education, or literacy now? Okay, so literacy, I want to say that I still come to the teachers. We cannot dodge the teachers. Um, you know, a lot of teachers are not very, especially when you talk of um, hard to reach terrain. Mm -hmm. So some of them are not very motivated. And so when you get to some of the schools, you may see only three teachers in the whole school. So one is the teacher, the teacher capacity, mm -hmm. the number of teacher and teacher not, mm -hmm. I don't want to say absenteeism because sometimes they're not available. Mm -hmm. Then the children, mm -hmm. I mean, we have materials that can be developed. We have um, like we, we call home packs, take away home packs. Mm -hmm. These home packs were developed by a lot of organizations, including UNICEF, during this time of COVID-19, when it was clear that we wanted to ensure that education continues mm -hmm. even in an emergency. Mm -hmm. So those take away home packs, that's one. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we talk of parental education. It's something that people maybe, uh, I, we feel that attention needs to be redirected. Mm -hmm. If a parent has some basic skills, 
he can support the child. Mm -hmm. There are some things that can be done at home, and there are some things that can be done in school. Mm -hmm. But it's children are at a formative um, age of their life. They need to be constantly challenged, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of um, um, lit literacy material, numeracy material. Mm -hmm. If not, they lose interest. Okay. Yes, I know that in our climb, uh, we're not too conversant about homeschooling. It is very, very uh, popular in the Western world. Do you think it's, uh, sh it should be embraced in our climb, homeschooling? So homeschooling, you know, there are some situations where homeschooling can be very good. But um, one thing we talk about, you know, protection issues. Mm -hmm. Sometimes school is like um, a safety net for mm -hmm. children because sometimes the perpetrators of abuse, mm -hmm. violence, mm -hmm. are in the school, mm -hmm. are in the house, are in mm -hmm. the home. At home. Some of them are family members, mm -hmm. uncles, aunties that, you know, came, and then, you know, children get mm -hmm. abused. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, we try to encourage, mm -hmm. even for the COVID, mm -hmm. um, it was like, let's try to get the children mm -hmm. back to school mm -hmm. as much as possible. Okay. Now, let's talk about uh, the, 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 the homegrown school feeding program. Mm -hmm. Yes. That also, and in the face of intermittent or let me call it intermittent strikes mm -hmm. by teachers mm -hmm. what would you describe this I would say probably is it a setback I will agree with you why it's a setback because food home um, um, school feeding is a kind of in incentive it's a kind of um, what would I say? It's an incentive for children to come to school. Some children don't get the basic meals at home. Mm -hmm. So home f um, 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 school oh. feeding mm -hmm. is not just the food. There are some other aspects, the warming, vitamin C and all that. Mm -hmm. They can get that in the school. So that was one of the reasons why when they were children were at home during the COVID-19, you know, it was like some of them had to resource to other means to get food. Mm -hmm. So. I think it's a bit, if, if it's, a, it's an excellent program, if it can be, you know, continued and if it can be used to reach, to kind of um, close the inequity divide from poverty. Mm -hmm. Poverty as per relating to being able to produce, I mean, provide food for your children at home. Okay. Now let's talk about the theme for this year's Observers. That's uh, bringing the digital world closer. Yes. Let's talk about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, literacy, you know, Literacy, we have the traditional means, but now we're in the jet age, mm. we're in the digital world. So um, you see even a lot of our organizations, Federal Ministry of Education, they're involved in digital learning, digital training, mm. with regards to even content development, mm -hmm. um, um, resource development, contextualized to Nigeria and uploaded. Mm. Because we see that with the digital, um, the digital world, Information can get anywhere. It, it has a wider reach than just coming to school and all that. And we saw the potentials during the COVID-19 lockdown when nobody could go anywhere. And it was actually, and you know, not just having that as an intervention, but also being able to do monitoring and evaluation and try to assess, is learning happening? Mm. Because it's another thing to be, you know, mm -hmm. training, teaching, mm -hmm. is learning. The only way you can, you can ascertain that learning is happening is when you can do an assessment mm -hmm. and see, okay. Mm -hmm. So the digital technologies, they have ways mm -hmm. where you can actually assess and know if learning is going on. Okay. Thank you for joining us on Nationwide. My pleasure. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. We'll be talking to Judith Giwamu, Education Officer, UNICEF. Thank you so much. <laughs> Moving on now, the 64th United Nations World Tourism Commission for Africa meeting has ended with far-reaching agreements that the developed countries should stop the continued strangulation of Africa for it to attain its potentials and accelerate growth and development. Anthony Forsen has more on that. The conference, which was declared open by the Cape Verdean president, George Carlos Fonseca, laid the platform that keyed into Nigeria's position of pursuing a three-point agenda with an additional call for private investors to buy into the tourism sector, pointing out that government alone cannot drive the industry. The Secretary General United Nations World Tourism Organization applauded the resilience of African nations in remaining resolute in the face of the pandemic. Of course, Tupito will stay in the center to maintain and to attract more and more investments in the private sector. 
uh, uh, for investment in Africa. And this is the second step, step by step, uh, as I mentioned, it is pilot project for us to do presential events because investors want to feel what are the opportunities for, what are the incentives. Uh, and the major takeaways from uh, today's meeting is that once again, uh, uh, African ministers displayed a lot of maturity, a sort of consensus to save the Commission for Africa and the entire United Nations World Trade Organization from, you know, imminent, uh, you know, collapse or disagreement, especially when it came to how to fill vacant uh, offices. Uh, I think uh, everybody made its own contribution, its own sacrifices. At the end of the day, we did not need to vote on any of the vacant uh, offices. Tanzania has won the 65th hosting right of the UNWTO CAF meeting holding next year. In Cape Verde, Anthony Forson, NTA News. President Muhammad Buhari has approved the appointment of Fatima Waziri Azi as Director General of the National Agency for Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, NAPTIP. This is sequel to a recommendation of the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, Sadia Umar Farouk, who expressed the urgent need for the ministry to intensify on the existing capacity in NAPTIP to achieve its key result areas as identified. A former head of the Department of Public Law at the Nigerian Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, Waziri Azi is a woman's right advocate, a campaigner against domestic and sexual-based violence, and an expert in the rule of law. Similarly, President Buhari has approved the appointments of new chief executives for some agencies in the Ministry of Education. A statement by Director of Press in the Ministry of Education indicates that Professor Akpama Simon Ibo has been appointed as Executive Secretary, National Commission for Mass Literacy, Adults and Non-Formal Education, while Professor Chinwe Veronica Anunobi is the Director and Chief Executive Officer, National Library. Professor Musa Garba Meitafsir is the Director and Chief Executive Officer, National Teacher Teachers Institute. The three appointments are with effect from 2nd of September 2021 and for an initial tenure of five years. The president also approved the reappointment of Professor Josiah Olusegun Najiboye as a registrar and chief executive officer, Teachers Registration Council of Nigeria for a second and final tenure of five years, effective from 1st of August, 2021. Similarly, Professor Bashir Usman has been reappointed as the executive secretary, National Commission for Nomadic Education, also for a second and final tenure of five years. President Mohamed Buhari felicitates with Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, General Buba Mohamed Buba Marwa, on his 68th birthday. The President congratulates the former military governor of Old Borno State and military administrator of Lagos State on the auspicious occasion joining members of All Progressive Congress, APC, to rejoice with the public servant who continues to distinguish himself in leadership. President Buhari commended General Marwa for the aggressive war against drug and illicit substance. The president affirms that the track record of the former chairman, Presidential Advisory Committee for the Elimination of Drug Abuse, and ambassador to South Africa and kingdoms of Lesotho and Swaziland has been inspiring, reflecting his passion, training, and experience both local and international. You're still watching Nationwide. Let's join Ruth in Lagos for more reports. Hello, Ruth. Hello, Lydia. Literacy is a powerful tool for the eradication of poverty. And as COVID-19 continues to threaten the global education system, the United Nations is focused on addressing drawbacks in the sector, which is why the theme of this year's International Literacy Day is Literacy for Human-Centered Recovery, Narrowing the Digital Divide. Hengenu John Adams tells us more. 
the teaching and learning were disrupted globally by the coronavirus pandemic. Schools had to shut down as the virus spreads aggressively. The shutdown invariably altered academic calendars. Statistically, the United Nations records show that at the initial phase of the global health crisis, closure of schools affected more than 62% of students across the world. This is a major setback to the Sustainable Development Goal 4, which is centered around ensuring that all young people achieve literacy. Learning became very difficult, except for in few instances, very few indeed compared to the multitude of people who could not access educational facilities. Though it came as a surprise, some families utilized the lockdown as a period to engage children academically at home. Some schools resorted to the use of technology to interface with students. With physical classes now back, this year's International Literacy Day celebration focuses on human-centered recovery from the negative effects of the virus on education. Experts believe that starting from the basic level and use of technology will help in achieving the desired results. There are some states up to this moment that are still far behind in recovering from the effects and the impact of the pandemic on the education of the state. Primary secondary institution is where most people are made. If you are going to be able to speak well, it will be, it will be made while you are in primary and secondary. Ensuring a literate world is important to global leaders. That is why the United Nations is promoting universal access to quality education and learning opportunities. In Lagos, Hingino John Adams, NTA News. Now away from education, the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency has deployed more effective and sophisticated means to uncover the various dubious strategies adopted by drug offenders to traffic hard and illicit substances. Chairman of the agency, Buba Marwa, was speaking at a media parley in Lagos where he gave an update on the seizure of amphetamine intercepted at the Apapa port in Lagos. Abolade Salami has the report. The spate of illicit drug abuse and trafficking in a long time has been on the increase with its negative effect on abusers and national security. While the NDL is intensifying efforts at curtailing the menace, illicit drug users are yet to pay attention to sensitization and series of enlightenment workshops organized to educate abusers on dangers associated with drug abuse. Recently, the agency, in its proactive approach, beamed its searchlight on a container laden with 451,807 tablets of drugs suspected to be amphetamine, captagon, weighing 74.119 kilograms, concealed in a rotor coil worth 5.8 billion naira. That this will cause had this passed through to the recipients in Nigeria. I think the message must be clear now that the NDLEA has zero tolerance for the production of drugs, trafficking of it, and of course drug abuse. Further investigation conducted on the ad drug revealed that this is the first time this drug is being brought into any African country in the south of the Sahara. One of the most dangerous, obnoxious, one of the worst pills, stimulant pills called Keptacon, which you can see there. The agency says Captagon, a dangerous drug, is being abused by offenders in troubled Middle East and has wreaked havoc across Europe. In Lagos, Abola de Salami, NTA News. Maiduguri is our next point of call and Abubakar is standing by, but that will be after our first break. Do stay on. Bad
for staying with us on Nationwide on the Nigerian Television Authority up to this moment. And this is Meduguri Zonal Network Center. Let's begin with health matters. As part of efforts to further contain the spread of cholera outbreak in the state, Borno State Government has constituted a 13-man committee for the control of the disease. Yagum Subuka reports that the inauguration of the committee became necessary as Borno State has recorded 559 suspected cases of cholera with 43 deaths so far. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control announced over 60,000 cases of cholera, including a case fatality rate of 3.3% reported from 23 states and the Federal Capital Territory as at 2nd September this year. This development necessitated the need for proactive measures by Bruno State Government to contain further spread of the disease, hence the inauguration of a high-powered committee for the control of cholera under the chairmanship of Chief of Staff to Bruno State Governor, Professor Isamurti Husseini, with Commissioner of Health Juliana Beatrice as secretary of the committee. Inaugurating members of the committee, but no state deputy governor Umar Us directed all rapid response teams for disease surveillance in affected local government areas to ensure timely response of all suspected cases. The constitution of the committee became rather necessary in view of the government's commitment to return and settle all internally displaced persons at their various communities. Chairman of the committee, Professor Issa Murti Husseini, assured to contain further spread and recommend preventive measures. We have to construct more latrines, especially in the IDP camps and other places, and also we should uh, ask people, or at least uh, sensitize people, not to go and defecate in the rivers and where you have uh, uh, flowing water. The terms of reference of the committee is to determine level of preparedness for the control of the outbreak and ascertain the causes of cholera, among other things. In Medugri, Yagum Subukar, NTA News. Borno State Government has distributed canoes to areas prone to flooding as the rains intensify to enable the residents carry on with their socio-economic activities in the areas affected. Now, this followed the unfortunate incident that occurred last month when seven people died as a boat capsized due to overload in Shani local government area of the state. Murjano Tuhasan completes the story. Shani local government area of Borno State is situated in southern part of the state, an agrarian community known for the production of a variety of crops such as maize, soybeans and rice among others, making the area popular in such business activities. River Howell and Gongola cross through the area, hence the need for canoe as means of transportation. Worried by the tragedy that we held Shani, Borno State Government distributed canoes to ease transportation and boost social economic activities of the rural area. While assuring the beneficiaries of government's determination towards developing the area, the council chairman called on the community to desist from crossing the river at night and overloading the canoes. Mm. 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 The people of the area are appreciative of the council's efforts. In Meduguri, Murjana Tuhasan, NTA News. And those are the latest stories for now from Meduguri. It's now time to return to Lydia in Abuja for the next set of reports on Nationwide. Good afternoon. Many thanks. The Nigerian Television Authority is strengthening partnership with the Association of Professional Women Engineers of Nigeria as part of measures to encouraging the girl-child enrollment in engineering sciences disciplines. This is coming when the national leadership of the association fraternized with the NTA ahead of its national symposium and award for scholarship for girls in science. The body is also advocating more female representation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics courses and projects in the engineering field to improve women's participation in economic development. History to be a female engineer because there are many companies, especially multinationals, who are forward-looking, who are deliberately seeking to increase the number of women engineers in their employ. So we have come a long way. In NTA, all the female engineers, they are living up to expectation. They are doing well, and many of them have a lot of managerial and higher position. The partnership is in line with NTA's commitment in promoting girl education 
and social well-being in the society. Economic activities in just North and other parts of the metropolis have received a boost following the gradual return of peace and relaxation of curfew by the state government. Zinred Digmum has details. The curfew in Joss North and ban on tricycles affected socio-economic activities in the last few weeks in Joss Metropolis, following the crisis that led to destruction of lives and property. The state government leaves the curfew and ban on the tricycle after a review of the security situation. A visit to major streets in Joss Metropolis indicates that normalcy is gradually returning to the state, with economic activities picking up gradually, as opposed to a few weeks ago. This follows the review of curfew from 10 o'clock in the night to 6 o'clock in the morning and the lift of ban on tricycles by the state government. Now that they've lifted the curfew, I believe that now the, the market will improve more. At least now customers, they are entering the market. Uh -huh. At least today is more better than the other days for us. It's a worker development because uh, it will reduce the hardship on the masses. Some tricycle operators in the metropolis express readiness to collaborate with relevant authorities to ensure that their members are registered for easy identification. We are going to make sure that every rider must be law abiding. We should be seen to revert to a status of the home of peace and tourism by coming together, by doing the needful. The needful in this case, it means that we should be seen to obey laws. We should not take the laws into our hands. The state government is working on legislations and enforcement modules for enhancing security and availability of public transportation. In Joss, Zen Redding Moon, NTA News. We now join Larry in Ibadan for more reports on Nationwide. Larry, it's over to you. Thank you, Lydia, and welcome to Ibadan. The All Progressives Congress in our state says inadequacies noted in the local government congress in the state last Saturday are being addressed to make the party stronger in the state. This was the concession of opinions of some of party leaders in the state. Lanry Bilei completes the report. The local government congress in Oyo State had witnessed large turnout of enthusiastic supporters who trunked various venues to participate in the exercise. At most of the venues, the accreditation and order processes were done by the officials to the delight of most members. Part of the challenges include the allegation of parallel congress. A chieftain of the party who took part in the exercise at O2 Itesuaji local government area, Professor Adeolu Akonde, and the Publicity Secretary, Dr. Olatunde Abdulaziz, reacts. The preference of the National Secretariat of the party, the national leadership of the party, is that the leadership at all levels should be recruited through consensus means by which members of the party will come together and agree on a common list of executives to govern the affairs of the party. We achieve this in most of the local governments in Oyo State. After every Congress, there must be reconciliation. Of course, uh, we have the mechanism with which we do that. On the total assessment of the exercise in the state, the turnout indicated that members of the party are still loyal to their party. The various results of the local government congress and the state have been collated and treated accordingly in Ibado. Larry. The National Directorate of Employment, NDE, has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Oyo State Government. Correspondent Ayomiku Ajibola reports that the MOU is aimed at fighting mass unemployment through direct intervention in skills training and employment programs for youth employability. All over the world, unemployment is a serious problem that hinders the normal life of a society. This issue constantly crops up and is eliminated by applying various mitigating strategy. To cope with this, the federal government established the National Directorate of Employment, NDE, 28 years old Samuel Wisdom from Akwaibom, and 35 years old Sheriff Adetoji from Oyo State are both beneficiaries of the directory training currently ongoing in Ibadan. 
I don't think I need a job again because I'm already employed, I'm self-employed. If this kind of a program uh, is really going on, it will help um, graduates. To strengthen the mandate of NDE, the directory signed a memorandum of understanding with the Oyo State Government for collaboration in areas of skills training and other empowerment initiatives. It is my conviction that the partnership will be a shining example for other state governments across the Federation. It is important to note that we live in a rapidly changing global economy which demands new ideas and skills to be made competitive. The key player said the task for meeting the legitimate desire of youth for decent jobs requires a synergy of collaborative initiative among relevant stakeholders. In Ibadan, Ayomiku, Ajibola, NTA News. We are still watching Nationwide or the network service of the NTA. Let's join Mina in Enugu for more report. Welcome back to Nationwide. A new acting chief judge, Justice Raymond Zemina, has been sworn in to head the Enugu State Judiciary. Justice Ozemina replaces the just retired State Chief Judge Priscilla Emehelu. Susan Aze has the details. I, Akoli, Raymond Ozemina, do something with that that I will be faithful and bear to allegiance to the Trial Court of Nigeria as acting to judge of the United States. Justice Raymond Ozemina was sworn in as acting chief judge in Ugo State following his confirmation by the National Judicial Council, NJC, as the most senior judge in the state after the just retired chief judge, Justice Priscilla Emehelo, grateful for the privilege to serve the state, particularly the judiciary. Justice Ozemina acknowledged that his predecessor performed well in office and urged the bar and the bench, as well as the entire judiciary staff, to join hands with him to improve on the legacies already on ground. I have come to serve the state judiciary. I will do my best, all of you should join me, to make sure that everything is being done, is done, remains intact. We shall do our best, however. Congratulating the new acting chief judge, the state governor, Ifani Ugwani, expressed confidence that Justice Ozemena will bring his wealth of experience to bear in the discharge of his duties. In Enugu, Susan Eze, NTA News. The Enugu State Governor's Task Force on COVID-19 has embarked on a five-day sensitization campaign and monitoring of citizens' compliance to safety protocols. Dominica Onya has details. The task force team, led by its coordinator, paid an advocacy visit to the chief imam of Enugu Central Mosque, Asata, the Archbishop of Enugu Ecclesiastical Province, Anglican Communion, and Bishop of Enugu Diocese, and the chairman, Traditional Rulers Council of Enugu State, to remind people that coronavirus, especially the deadly Delta variant, is still around. As we speak now, we have not seen any case. We don't want to let loose on our guards. We want to remind you to continue with all the safety protocols. They promised to take his message to their people and ensure that they adhere to the preventive measures put in place. The messages you have given me this uh, morning will get to all the traditional rulers. However, Bishop Chukuma pointed out that the sensitization exercise should also be taken to the porous areas of spreading the virus, like motor parks, markets, and tricycle riders. You have to help those who help themselves. If you don't help yourself, it will be very difficult for you to be able to help yourself. It's important that everyone should know that God can only help you when you help yourself by being obedient to the protocol. All these things are safety measures. Portable hand sanitizers, face masks, and copies of safety guidelines with pictures and illustrations are given to these leaders for their people. In Enugu, Dominica Onya, NTA News. And that's a bit from here. It's now back to Lydia in Abuja for the rest of Nation World. Thank you, Mina.
The Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development has distributed sweet potato vines enriched with vitamin A to 600 farmers in Katsina to boost food security in the country. Shewa Damu reports that the beneficiaries were also trained on the economic and nutritional value of the improved sweet potato vines. Nigeria is one of the largest producers of sweet potato in sub-Saharan Africa, with annual production estimated at 3.46 million tons per year. Considering the economic importance of the crop, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development distributed improved variety of sweet potato vines enriched with vitamin A to 600 farmers each from 14 selected states in Nigeria. Move around the states tell the farmers about the importance of this potato, most especially on this vitamin A uh, uh, component benefit that they can derive from it. After training them, we want them to go back and train their members and make sure that this seed, this vine, reach all the farmers in the state. So this vines now, it is the federal government that is coming in in order to boost the production of orange flesh sweet potato. The beneficiaries who were drawn from different farmer groups described the development as the first of its kind and placed to upscale the knowledge acquired during the training. I now know how uh, additional value of potato. Sweet potato occupies a global position as a source of food and industrial raw material and is also identified to be the fourth root crop in Nigeria after cassava, yam and cocoa yam. In Kasana, Shehu Ademu, NTA News.